Good morning, and welcome to today's webcast, Drive Digital Strategy and Transformation for HR. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our group CPE attendance sheet available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, with that, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter for Moss Adams, Brett Addis. Hey, Chad, thanks for, um, thanks for the intro. And I, I, before I start, I just wanna thank everyone for joining. I know that um, there's a number of different webcasts and webinars and things that you can be taking advantage of and we truly appreciate you spending the next uh, 60 minutes or so with us so i'm going to try to make it as an informative and as fun as possible to uh to get your uh, cpe credit so let, let me just kind of start uh, off a little bit by talking about uh, the overall session um some of you may or may not have joined some of my prior webcasts, um, but really in short, you know, what we're really looking at doing and trying to talk, uh, trying to discuss today is really focusing on the importance of, of really looking at our overall digital strategy as it relates to HR. But I will tell you, as I go through this topic, there's a lot of things in here that can directly correlate with, with other lines of business. Um, some of the topic is very HR-ish, um, but I just want to outline that for some of you who are joined, who I know are specifically tied or, or within an HR department. But, you know, as we really look at going into the session, you know, we all understand what's going on in the ecosystem as it relates to having a shortage of talent, which is impacting our overall ability to recruit. Uh, we have record low engagement levels across all industries. And, and we're seeing a really big issue with a lot of our clients, as well as research tells us that uh, from a retention perspective, Right, we're having a lot of ch challenges uh, retaining a lot of our talent and top talent. And I would even go as far as critical talent. And there's a lot of things that go into that. And, and, and I'm not gonna boil and really get into the, the depths and boil, boil the ocean on that specific topic today. I've talked about that a little bit in the past. But what I do really wanna focus on is, is really building and working with you to, to help you understand building the right infrastructure to support some of those initiatives as well as others. So I'm gonna introduce myself quickly, and then um, we'll talk about some of the learning objectives for a CPE perspective, and then we'll dive into uh, some of the content. So really quick, uh, my name is Brett Addis. I am the practice director uh, for Moss Adams. I lead our human capital advisory uh, practice. Basically what that means is uh, we support our clients in modernizing and optimizing uh, them the best to manage their workforce. And that really looks at 
from an HR perspective, how they operate their people, their processes, as well as technology. A um, little background about myself. I joined Moss Adams and started this practice uh, this, just this past December, so I'm fairly new. Prior to that, I spent nine years at SAP leading their global customer transformation office, um, several years of management consulting, and I actually started my career as an HR practitioner and, and leader. So been in the space for a long time. In fact, right before this session, I was calculating it and I said, wow, the time has flown. It's been 26 years and I've been doing this a long time, which um, there's a lot of gray that uh, outlines that. So that's a little bit about me um, and, and a little bit about what uh, the human capital practice means and, um, and how we engage with our clients. So let's talk for a few minutes just about the learning objectives. So there's a couple things that I wanna knock off here really quickly. Uh, first and foremost, um, one of the things that we're gonna do is discuss the purpose of digital transformation. This is a, a really interesting conversation. Um, and I will tell you that if I walk into a thousand companies, I'm gonna get a thousand different definitions. So I wanna boil this down for you a little bit, unpack it, really talk about the difference between digital transformation and digitization, um, as well as some of the key outcomes that, uh, that you can get from that. But it's a, it's a very big differentiator and I don't really think that a lot of organization under, under organizations understand the difference, um, but it's important that you, that you do that. Second, we're gonna benefit some of the, uh, sorry, summarize some of the benefits of a digital transformation strategy uh, for, for HR. We're gonna share some leading practices around actually designing a strategy um, to help move you forward from a, an HR and a workforce perspective. Describe and building blocks of what that strategy is. And of course, uh, provide some additional leading practices in terms of some tools and templates that, uh, that you can use along the way. So with that said, um, let's dive in. So I wanna actually start with um, a really interesting study. Now this study isn't new, but as I was preparing for the session, I came across this and, and I'll tell you how in just a second. And I was sitting there thinking to myself is, wow, you know, this really tells a very interesting story and, and you can correlate this to organization transformation. So basically what the study was is um, Cooper Institute did a, did a big study a couple of years ago that said that only 25% of those, those people who make New Year's resolutions carry their resolutions past the first week in January. So we're basically saying, hey, I'm gonna go on a diet, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start working out, I'm gonna start jogging, I'm gonna eat better, whatever it is, in about a week, only about 25% of those people, basically, they stop, right? And a mere 8% are actually successful in achieving their goals. And so you're probably asking, why are you talking about New Year's resolutions in a digital strategy conversation? Well, the reason that I thought this was really interesting is this is really comes back to mindset and behaviors. And what this also ties back to is what you'll hear me talk about a lot is around the difference between desire and commitment. And so we all go through at the end of the year and we make commitments to ourselves again, whether it's losing weight, working out, uh, doing this, doing that. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is are, really, are we really committed to doing those things? Based on this research, the answer is no. And, and, and so when I start thinking about this research and, I, and it kind of hit me because there's some, st some statistics that we'll talk about here in a few minutes, I was saying, you know what? How many clients do I go in and talk about and have a desire to optimize, to modernize, to automate, to innovate? And then we actually get through it, we start the process, and they're like, wow, this is really hard. This is really challenging. You know what? I don't know if we're ready to do this. And so what happens is, just like the first week of New Year's resolutions, people start to fall off. And a very small few organizations actually are successful when it comes to meeting some of those digital strategy and transformation objectives. And so I thought this was a very interesting correlation. And, and, and again, it's kind of a personal one, but it also ties right directly into organization one. I'm not gonna ask any questions about this, but I do think it's really fascinating when you start to think again about mindset and behaviors. And this is gonna be a really key piece as we go forward, because again, I may have the desire to transform and, and, and fulfill my digital strategy. 
I may have the mindset that I want to go do that, but do I really have the commitment and behaviors to back that up? Now, this isn't just an individual thing. This is an organizational piece. But I think it's a very interesting and fascinating correlation when we start looking at success of organizational transformations and digital strategy versus the failure. And let's talk a little bit more in depth about that. So one of the things I wanted to, to share, oops, sorry, my slide didn't go, is you know, why do organizations, especially within HR, really feel like there's a big need to transform? So first of all, let me kind of take a step back and say that digital strategy and transformation is no longer a nice to have. You know, we looked at this 20 years ago and we would look at the innovation of technology. We would look at cool things like self-service back in the day. And I would say, even say many companies look at self-service as cool today. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. But, the way, but where organizations are, the pace of change and the need for talent has, has completely changed and shifted the way HR needs to work as an organization. It can no longer be a personnel department focused on driving payroll. It actually has to be a strategic partner a talent driver, a talent influencer into the business. And there's three things as I was thinking about this, as I was preparing for this session, that I'm gonna come back to later on that really come back, that really kind of tied this together for me and I hope it does the same for you. So the first of all is why are organizations looking to, why are HR organizations looking to really transform? The first is relevance. And basically what relevance means is relevance equals adding value. And so when I go back to my last statement about personnel and payroll, that's a very, that's a transactional element that may be adding value or getting people paid. But is it really a differentiator? Is it really a strategic action? Is it really looking overall at workforce planning, understanding talent, understanding what your needs are? Being able to bring that information to the business about predicting what talent needs, understanding talent skill sets, understanding where talent gaps are going to be is a really big value add to organizations as they think about potentially rolling out new services, rolling out new products, growing uh, either organically or through acquisition. They need to understand what talent pool is out there to support it. The second one is what I call difference. And basically what that means is, is the HR organization helping the organization become a become a competitive differentiator. And what that means is, is, is HR providing the level of services and programs that help drive cultural awareness, brand awareness, employer value proposition, employee um, in acquisition, employee engagement, right? So are, is, there a, is, there a, is there a competitive differentiator where people look at your organization and say, I wanna work there because I get an amazing experience as an employee. They're, they're, they're best in class, they're innovative, I get career development, my leaders and managers coach and develop me. Is that, is that, is it, are they delivering that level of difference? And, and that is a massive thing to think about as you look at why people aren't joining your company versus why they're joining others. The last one is demand. And demand is really simple. Is, is the HR organization and the workforce able to meet the supply and demand of the business needs? Are they able to ebb and flow? Are you able to, to meet your productivity levels, your performance levels? And is HR able to offer those programs and services that allow you to do that? So I'm not gonna spend more time on this. I'm gonna come back to this in a little bit later and, and we'll unpack this a little bit more. Actually, it's a call to action, a little tip for the end. I hope it didn't ruin this for you. But, but these are really strategic things that as I go in and think about organizations who are looking to transform, I often challenge them with these, is answer these three questions. And you, don't, you can either answer them to me or you can answer them by yourself and sit together in a leadership meeting. And, I, and again, I'm correlating these back to HR, but this could be finance, this could be IT, this could be procurement, this could be supply chain. There's a, there's a number of ways that this could be framed out. But I think this is a really interesting questions to, to ask yourself. So I did talk about this in one of my last sessions, but since we're talking about digital strategy, 
um, I wanted to incorporate this because, again, this is another number one of those statistics that have shifted tremendously over the last couple of years, but also aren't that great. And, and so let me kind of explain what I mean by that. So the, the top level of this is basically saying that 70% of organizations have a strategy to transform, okay? And what? Let, and let me kind of unpack what a strategy is, right? A strategy basically means I have a vision, I have core guiding principles in terms of how I make decisions, I've got clear goals and KPIs in terms of how I'm going to measure my transformation, not only at the end, but having key milestone metrics to measure along the way, but I also have a clear uh, plan and roadmap put in place that's prioritized in order for me to meet my short-term needs, my mid-term needs, and my long-term needs, right? That's basically what a strategy looks like. There's some different shapes and forms. Some come in a house, some come in bubbles, a number of different things. That doesn't matter. But kind of that's the fundamental uh, of what a strategy is. The interesting thing, though, is 70 to 90% of organizations that have a strategy still fail. Now, I'm going to kind of tie this back to a second to the, the first Cooper quote, which says that, hey, we have a desire. I have a strategy, which is a desire. But why are we still failing? The scary thing about this 70 to 90 percent is if you were to ask me this number two years ago, I would have told you it was between 70. Well, it actually was around 70 percent. It's actually increased 20 percent in the last two years around transformation failure. This to me is extremely scary. Um, it's scary because what this is telling me is, is just because I have a strategy doesn't mean I can execute it. It is the execution meaning I don't have the level of commitment because um, we clearly have a desire or is it because we don't have the right skill sets? We don't have the right budgets. We don't have the right infrastructure. We don't have the right decision models. We don't have the right uh, resources. There's a number of reasons why transformations fail. But historically, I would say 90% of transformations fail because they didn't have a strategy. That's not necessarily the case now. Now it's the case of I have a strategy, I can't execute. And a lot of that execution, let's go back, I want to lose weight. There, there's a lot of things that I need to do to lose weight. I need to put into work, I need to have the time, I need to do all these things. Are organizations just wanting to jump to an end state instead of really putting in the hard work to make sure they have a successful outcome? I talk to clients all the time, and, and I'll give you an example. I was meeting with one about a week or so ago, and we were talking about digital transformation. And I said, hey, you know, there's, a, there's some really core readiness type um, activities or, or, or foundation that you really need to put in place to be successful, right? You need to have a strategy. Check, they have one, right? You need to make sure that you have the right business sponsorship. You need to make sure you have the right resource capabilities. You need to make sure you have the right governance structure, change management, dot, 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 dot. And I'm happy to send all of these things to you. And the question really, the, the answer that I got was, yeah, that's all great, I understand that, but we just want to get over here, right? And I said, but if you don't have a strategy, how do you know where you're going? If you don't have a strategy, how do you know who you need to get there? If you don't have a strategy, how do you know how much money it's gonna cost, right? And this is really where all of this starts to unpack is around the execution of the overall strategy, right? So part of what I'm gonna do today is walk you through the development of strategy, but I'm not gonna do that quite yet. I'm gonna hold you a little bit longer because I have 50 minutes I have to present. So um, you're gonna get me for at least that amount of time. So let's jump to the next piece. And I kind of alluded to this. So going back to that, that, that last piece around 70 to 90% of failure, the other research tells us is that 75% of transformations, achieving their digital transformation strategy, these companies do have, what are the earlier word, commitment, right? And again, commitment and buy-in are two different things. And I just wanna kind of just on, let's take a step back here. A lot of times I'll go into organizations and I'll say, hey, you know, do, do you have a business case? Yes, we, we've got sign off or we've got a buy off. In my opinion, that's a financial decision, right? Commitment means that I'm going to give you my time, my energy, my resources, everything I have to be successful, right? So when I read this, right, and it says successful transformations have 
com uh, committed sufficient time, energy, and resources. We said they are literally saying, I am taking time away from my organization, productivity, profitability, to make sure that this transformation is successful because I know that when it's successful, we will be, we will have higher productivity, higher performance, higher um, revenues, et cetera, et cetera. So the commitment piece is extremely critical. Now, if I were to go in and poll each of you as we go, as we're having this conversation, especially those of you who are considering transformation or already gone through transformation, what are the areas that you need, that you need to focus on, or what were some of your gaps that didn't make you as successful you'd wanna be? These are probably three of the things that would rise to the top. These are three of the things that we need to make sure that we're addressing very early on as we socialize that digital strategy to make sure people are extremely aware, they understand and are committing to what they know they need to commit to, right? It's easy to commit to a business case because I see a number. Let me back up. It's easier to sign off and sponsor a business case because I see a number. It's different to commit to achieving that number by doing all of these things. So what I wanna do now is a quick poll. Um, and I'm gonna get some help from my team to deliver this, but um, which of the digital transformation drivers apply to your organization? We have business alignment, we have business or operating model shifts, process efficiency and cost, technology, workforce experience. Which one of these, as you think are transforming or did transform, are those main drivers? And I know there's a lot of these and it's not a trick question. I just, I just really interested. Got 159 responses out of 361. We'll give you guys just about 10, 15 seconds and then we'll go over to the, uh, the results. All right, Any, oh, we're still climbing, so I'll just let you guys keep going. If I have to speed up at the end, I'll speed up at the end. All right. Looks like we're slowing down, Chad, so we can probably go ahead and turn it over. All right. So which of the digital transformation drivers applied to your So first was business alignment. So basically business alignment means, hey, from an HR perspective, I want to better align myself, my goals, my outcomes with the business, right? So we have 11 uh, percent. Operating model shifts. That's actually I'm surprising. That's that's as low as it is, because um, part of process efficiency of cost is reevaluating your operating models, um, technology innovation, interesting. I was actually expecting that to be much higher as well. Workforce experience, hot topic today. Again, another word that no one really understands. We'll, maybe we'll cover that on another section, another uh, webcast. Oh, data driven. I would expect that to be a lot, uh, a lot higher. But then again, we have, of course, the score of all the above at 42 per, 42%, which, um, which is awesome actually, uh, for those of you selected that, because I would agree there's so many interdependencies of all of these, you really can't do one without the other, which is why I kind of put all the above. So um, so well done on the 42%. And um, yeah, and uh, let's just, let's jump into the next area. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, um, as I open this up, we'll talk a little bit about what does digital transformation versus digitization mean? Um, and I actually wish we had an open chat here because I would actually ask that question just to be, uh, just to be, just because I'd be interested in what you said. But I'll just kind of dive into this. So, digital transformation really has nothing to do with technology. Let, let me just kind of say that, right? Digital transformation is really focused on a mindset shift of how the organization needs to improve, become more effective, become more. Um, uh, optimize, modernize, whatever other buzzword you would like to use, 
um, through the use of technology, right? And so before you can actually get to the technology aspect, there's a lot of things that go into digital transformation. We'll talk about the strategy today. But it also talks about how you work differently, agile practice, flexible practice, a lot of different methodologies out there uh, that have come out recently that are really moving from more of a waterfall to an agile or, or scalable approach. And, and this is really what digital transformation is all about. A lot of people say, I want to digitally transform and I want to implement this system, and this system, and this system, and this system, and this system. Um, that's really not digital transformation. It, 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 again, digital transformation is really about the mindset of making the shift to become more digital. Um, and within that, you can see a bunch of little words. I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, but you know, part of that is is looking at. And I'll, I'll touch on a couple actually. But a, part of that is is really looking at a couple different things. One, we talked about agility. Um, the second is around experiment experimentation. Um, the other one is around innovation. And some of these words scare companies. Like, how do I become scalable? You know, what does that mean, right? Um, how, how do I how do I be experimental? I'm a very structured organization. So as you can see, this isn't necessarily the technology. It's basically changing the way you work to drive different levels of outcomes. Um, so let's kind of dive into the digitization piece. And I do actually have I'll call out one word additional word on here wirearchy. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that term. Um, it, it isn't a necessarily a new term, but it is a term that has taken many shapes and sizes, very similar to uh, matrix based management. But basically it means that as we think about digital transformation, it's about breaking down silos across the organization. So no longer is there uh, HR, finance, procurement, supply chain, et cetera. I mean, those functions exist but now they're an intertwined and interdependent uh, organization of data and process driven and influenced by technology, right? So really, there are really cool, some, some really cool studies on hierarchy organizations, if you get a chance. I don't have time to dive in that today. Uh, digitization, so what does that mean? So that is actually what most people think of digital transformation, which is now we're applying or implementing technologies to better support and optimize and modernize, and again, any other buzzard you want to use, to enhance our business operations. The challenge with this is that when we think about what's going on in the, the industry today, the tech industry, it's no longer about implementing an ERP, right? We have so many different types of technology influencers out there that many organizations really struggle with understanding what do they actually need and what do these different technology do, do, do? So very often we hear terms like automation, uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, um, you know, all of these other things. Well, the reality is, is that most solutions provide those things in many different ways and forms and fashions. But now the conversation is less about solutions, it's about platforms. What is the platform or the suite of solutions that I need to put in place. What's interesting about the whole technology infrastructure is that about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I'm, a, I'm really dating myself, right? There was a big shift from moving from a single platform, right? Like a common ERP to a, what they call best in breeds, right? So organizations were looking at, hey, what do I need to use for recruiting? What do I need for onboarding, performance management, finance, et cetera, et cetera. And it all wasn't tied to one system. In, in a lot of cases, it still is today, we have hodgepodge of various systems. Um, it, sometimes way too many, sometimes not enough. But then we move back to this ERP concept, which is, well, we need one single source of truth. We, we need one system to do all of these things. But the reality is, is that one single system typically isn't enough. And so now we've come up with the new app-based concepts. So you have a platform layer and they have multiple applications that sit on that platform layer that are highly integrated, right? Where the platform becomes the single source truth. Again, I'm not getting at all this with you, but I'm just trying to help you understand that from a digitization perspective, that's really where the technology is influencing and enabling your ability to achieve the strategy. And then the last piece is the value concepts, right? Which I don't have a lot of time to get into, but you know, it's, it's it, a lot of things I mentioned earlier, it's scale, it's differentiation, it's experience, it's driving engagement, business alignment, a lot of things 
as you really start looking at what, how to combine digital transformation, digitization together to achieve specific business outcomes. In this case, you know, we talk about HR. So I want to share a, um, a little bit of a, a journey with you for a couple slides. And, and this actually is very much HR, although I would say that, um, you know, if you are, if you're in a different line of business, you could use this model and kind of plug in your own things as well. But let me, uh, the story I want to tell you is back in 2010 ish, 28, 2010, uh, when I was in management consulting, um, there was this huge push I, and I don't know what caused the push. I think maybe this was the tipping point of where organizations started asking, what are these people doing in HR for me? And what, what you know, what value do they drive? Anyways, it doesn't really matter. But there was this huge push that all these organizations wanted to build these HR strategies, okay? And that was kind of 2010, right? It's like, hey, we didn't really know where our people were going, where people needs are. We don't really know what HR is doing for us. We need a strategy. Well, long story short, and this actually goes well beyond 2021 and today, um, there were a lot of pros people and process type progressions that were happening, right? So step one was the strategy, step two were some of the outcomes from the strategy. And so there's processes around, you know, war for talent. And here's what's really funny about this. Look at some of these titles today and ask yourself, are they not the same problems we're facing today? The answer to the question is yes, these problems don't go away. So let me just kind of go back. So 2011, big war for talent, uh, remote workforce started coming out. Um, 20, 2012 is really the year of data and compliance for HR. Um, this is where analytics and reportings became extremely important um, from, for regulation purposes, but also as we started looking at being able to understand our overall workforce. I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, but kind of fast forward now to where we are today now we're into this whole future of work piece. Do we return to work? Do we not return to work? Do we hybrid work? And a whole slew of other issues, right? Which I kind of talked about earlier, acquisition, engagement, retention, which again, as you can see through this slide, not a lot has changed in the last, eh, what is it, 20, 10, 13 years, 14 years, which in itself is a bit scary. But there was some progression, right? And, and what the big piece to take away from this is that HR did start to build certain programs and processes that align to some of these gaps. Now that's fantastic. Now again, if we wanna put our lens on, this is digital transformation, okay? Now I'm gonna to talk to you another slide about digitization. So when we look at the same time frame, there's really been about four stages of transformation. Again, these are HR, business finance, it doesn't matter. The first is around the transaction age, second collaboration age, third augmented age, last is intelligent age. Now, I wanna, I wanna just kind of pause for a second and say, look, some of the things on these screens, it's for some of, you, some of your organizations, you know, they are extremely future focused and, and that's totally okay. But I want you to know that where you are today, you're probably not, not alone. And I'll kind of talk to you about that in just a second. So let's kind of slide over to 2010, right? So self-service was a big push, self-service and mobility, meaning mobile phones, right? Now, just to give you, just to kind of flat out, this is 2010. It'd be interesting to poll, poll you guys, and I can't do that, to say how many of you offer self-service and mobile today, right? Again, just, just, as a, just as a clear understanding, it'd be fun little, fun, fun for all of us, right? The, the reason I asked that is because self-service came out in the 1970s. So we're talking 30, 40 years of having self-service from an ERP perspective, just now being a key functionality within our HR organizations. You know, and there's some of these things that some of you on the phone or on the call or the webcast are saying, hey, we don't even have self-service yet. The reality is, is that I have worked with very large enterprise companies. I'm talking 50, 100,000 employees who they still don't have self-service yet. So although these are kind of benchmark points in time of when features and functions came important, don't necessarily look and gauge yourself on this because there's a lot of different reasons and rationale. But I'm gonna kind of slide forward a little bit to give you some perspective. So transaction age, self-service, compliance, things like that, collaboration age, you know, this is where social collaboration came out, um, you know, the in internal, you know, kind of the internal collaboration, 
look to start looking at things like alumni management. So again, new new words for old things that are going on right now. Just another little quick tip for you. Um, the augmented age, which is we really where we start getting into artificial intelligence. And then we get into the intelligent age, which um, is really around AI augmented intelligence, which basically means that the system knows more than you do and it's telling you what to do based on different business scenarios and trends based on the data. I honestly don't expect any of you to have that. If you do, call me, love to talk to you about it. Um, but if you look at these models, as I said again, most of, our, most of the, the customers that I've dealt with over the last 20 years are still within that transaction collaboration age. You know, again, there's a desire to get into the augmented intelligent age, but is the commitment to shift the mindset and behaviors of the workforce there? Big challenge. It's not the technology isn't there, it's is the workforce ready to move there, okay? So I just wanna share that little journey with you because I think it's really interesting as we talk about the difference between digital, digital transformation and digitization. What goes in that list of digitization for your organization is unique to you. And whether you want to look at it as what do I need now, what do I need midterm or long term, that helps you demonstrate progression. But what it does allow you also to do is think about what your future state needs to look like and how you're actually going to get there. So let's dive into another poll. And I'll just read it out. So how would you describe your level of people, process, and technology maturity? You don't have to define it based on what I just showed you. Um, really from your own perspective, and you can use these definitions. So lagging, I haven't started doing any of this and I don't have, have a desire. Two, we're starting, we're evaluating what digital means for us, whether that's digitization or whether that's digital transformation. We're managing, which means we are initiating a transformation and leading, we've completed it, and then innovating, which means not only have we completed it, Brett, but we are continuously innovating on what we've done. Fifty-two percent. I'm gonna take a quick swig of my diet coke while you guys are doing that. All right, we'll give you about 15, 20 seconds here. Okay. Um, just a reminder: you got it. Must answer three of the four polling questions to receive CPE credit today. We have this one and two more. And these are a lot fun, more fun for us than they are you, and we understand that, but we do appreciate you doing it. All right, Brett, we're gonna move it on to the results here. Awesome, yep, let's do it. Okay, so the top one is, is we're managing. So we've initiated our transformation, we are in the process of managing it, um, which is at 39%, so well done. And I hope uh, hope this session is helping you. Uh, second is starting, which is we're evaluating what we do, and then um, lagging, we haven't started. Um, and I just wanna talk, so I wanna just uh, respond to some of these. So I think, again, as we look at digital transformation, for those of you who haven't started, um, maybe the reason is you don't know where to start. And, and that's perfectly normal. Um, and, and for those of you who are starting, Maybe you're really trying to figure out, like I mentioned earlier, what, what is digital transformation? What is digitization? What is all that? That's perfectly normal. Um, this, is a, this, is, this exercise of transforming is one of culture, is one of organizational readiness, and as I mentioned earlier, is around capabilities. And everybody's journey, regardless of what you hear, is unique and is their own. And so as you think, I say that because as you think of these, just because you haven't started doesn't mean you're behind. It just means maybe you need a little bit of help. And, you know, that's what we're here to do. All right, so let's jump into the next section. So I wanna spend a couple minutes on digitization of HR. This has been a topic 
Uh, one of my favorite topics, and you'll probably hear with every say that at least to one area in every webcast because I do have a lot of favorites. Um, the digitization of HR is extremely, extremely fascinating. Um, so just I'm gonna I'm gonna date myself, right? So I started my career in HR around let's just say 2000 ish. I was doing some other human capital stuff before that, but actually getting into the corporate HR umbrella in, in 2000. You know, I, I still remember, you know, filling out payroll action forms. I don't know if you guys remember the pink form, the green form, the blue form, the yellow form, and then everyone went in its different folders. Um, you know, and, and as I've progressed, you know, in my career and have had the opportunity to really engage with a, a number of thousands of organizations, candidly, across the world, you know, I, I have seen that this, this trend here has become you know, more and more difficult. And, and let me kind of share with you what I mean. So when we look at the, the digitization of HR, there's really three categories. Um, the first is around transactional and reactive. And that's basically what I said I did. You know, when I was in HR, well, my first career in HR, we were very transactional, right? Um, and, then, and then the second piece, which was interesting because my, my second half of my career I would actually say that from an HR perspective, and, and we're talking about a 100,000 employee company here, we were way more strategic and proactive probably than most organizations today. And this again was back in, you know, mid 2000s ish, right? But, we, what, but as we look at these two, the biggest challenge that we face is that organizations can't get out of their own way. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. And, 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 but when I look at these two, you can kind of see my little squirrel mark here. It's usually red, but they made me change it to green. Um, is that a lot of organizations, and I'm kind of talking to, I, I, I haven't started yet, or I'm starting to think about this. You know, there's a big, big, um, as I mentioned, mindset shift, but a very big planning exercise. Uh, and it's really, really difficult to, to move from this transactional reactive state to this strategic and proactive state. I mean, that's really, if you, if you start breaking this down, most organizations are right in the middle, right? And, and, and our goal as consultants, right, are to bring you leading practices and tools and templates and all this other great stuff to help you move from transactional reaction. The problem is this isn't just an HR problem. This is also a business problem because the business likes a lot of the transactional things. They like some of the handholding. They like some of the what I would call more manual or task intervention type of work. HR is now at a point where, you know, it's creating shared service models and service centers and all of these things to do some of this transactional work. But in a lot of times, even when you look at their HR business partner model, they're still getting pulled back into doing some of that work. And so they're really having a difficult time in separating transactional versus strategic. And therefore, they just continue to spurn, churn, and churn, and churn, and they never really progress the way they want to. Now, what's so what's even more fascinating about this, I like the word fascinating, so you hear me use it a lot. What else is fascinating about this, and the studies actually are, if you really get into this, we have a new age of HR called digital and automated. So let's take a look, let's go back in our minds. We have digital transformation, we have digitization, and we have value. So think about that digitization section, right? So basically what we're saying is all of the, the work and the efforts, not all of it, but the transactional work and efforts are basically being pulled and, and, and this enabling technology is being used to perform those duties. This session isn't about reduction of force, adding force. This isn't about that. This is just about the concept and the philosophy about moving from these different states. And, and what's challenging about this is that we as HR can't seem to let go. There's a desire, but we don't have the commitment either within ourselves or within our business to move to that future state. The only time I have ever seen HR fully digitally transform is when there has been an organizational initiative from the CEO that has said, listen, I am, I, I as the CEO are putting a, a stake in the ground and saying, we are now a technology company. We all need to act like a technology company. And all of you, finance, HR, supply chain, procurement, dot, 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 
need to come up with strategic plans and execute those plans to become digital. Doing this in a siloed state will never happen, where it's very difficult to happen, not because of desire, it's because the commitment and the effort and, and, and things by the business and with your own HR organization. People aren't willing to change unless the organization creates that change, okay? So I'm gonna keep going because I, um, I have a few minutes left and I wanna make sure I get through some of this. Um, so again, part of digitization of, trans, uh, of HR, like I mentioned, is really around moving a lot of the transactional elements to more strategic elements. Um, the goal of this is actually to have about 70% 70, 70 of what we look at is kind of a business interaction, right? Which is where HR is actually focusing on business problems with business leaders. And 30% is really going to be focused on leveraging that enabling technology. So again, when we get to people changes, it's not about layoffs. It's about building skills and capabilities to do new work. The next piece of this, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, I'll send out the presentation, but it's also about looking at not only the technology, the digitization component, but the digital transformation component, which I talked about earlier, and marrying those two together to understand what are those skills and capabilities I'm going to need to, to leverage and utilize these digital technologies, right? And this is a really crucial piece of this because a lot of organizations go and implement technology and they go, uh-oh, I don't have the right skills and capabilities. I don't have a data analyst, a reporting analyst. I don't have someone to help manage the, the vendor or manage the upgrades or enhancements and dot, 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 manage the configuration. We have to make sure that we're aligning the skills and capabilities in this instance of HR to HR technology. Again, you could put in HR replaced with whatever, same concepts. All right, so another quick poll. How would you describe, oh, how would you describe your current state HR organization based on the model that we talked about? All right, everyone, we'll give you about 15 more seconds here just to get the last people in. Chad, I need these at least 55 minutes or 65 minutes. I'm always, I'm always running over. All right, back. we're going to move on to the results. All right, awesome. So 61% transactional reactive, 29%, 29.2 strategic. And, and again, this is not uncommon. I would say this actually aligns very well with, with what we're seeing in the market. The question that we need to ask, and I guess you really need to ask is, you know, one is, do you have a desire to move to that next step? And number two is, what is it going to take? You know, what is that digital strategy plan? Which let's dive right into building that strategy. So I'm gonna walk through um, a couple concepts with you guys. Like I said, I'll send out some templates that are in this deck um, that you'll be able to look at, but I'll, I'll cover them at a very high level. Um, but basically, if you think about the fundamentals of what a strategy is, a digital strategy, it is really to articulate the alignment of its people process technology, right? You heard me say this a little bit before, probably a different way, but you know, if you don't know where you're going, how will you determine the right path to get there? And that could mean process design, technical design, that could be decision-making, all of these things, right? So there is a rhyme and reason why people have strategies. It's not just to say, I have a strategy, right? It's actually to help drive action into what you're trying to accomplish. And to develop that strategy, there's really six components of this. Um, I, I don't have time to go through all of them. I'm gonna touch on a couple of these today. The first is around the strategic purpose, which is really defining the direction. The second is the prioritization and planning, right? Which is literally looking at the work that needs to be done, determining when it needs to be done now, midterm, long-term, and really putting that into a, a firm, actional plan that you, can, that you can go work against, and I'll show you that. The third is a roadmap, which is really just the illustration of your path and, and a lot of times what you could do right this is a great tool to share around so it's more of an awareness tool 
but it's also a way to outline key milestones so people understand what's happening when, any key dependencies, any, any competing priorities, right, anything like that. Uh, the strategic action plan actually goes into the work that needs to be done, and this is very detailed. This is step-by-step, item-by-item, description, resources, goals, objectives, et cetera. The, 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 um, the fifth is a business case, which is creating the case for change or what they call the value. And then the last one is the value realization component, which is making sure that I'm managing the, the managing the transformation. Again, not only understanding the, the the end result, but being able to articulate and demonstrate value throughout. So I'm just going to hit on a couple slides just so I can show you, and so you'll see some of these templates. Uh, the first one is really just uh, setting the direction. It's kind of the the first page, if you will, of a strategy. The way that we design them, it has a, a vision statement. Uh, we have create guiding principles, which really are our are, are anchors for how we make decisions. There are non-negotiables, if you will. So for example, I'm going through on implementing a tool and one of the guiding principles is scalable, which means I can change it fairly easy. If the answer is no, I can't change it, then the answer is we don't do it, right? So it really creates some very solid decision pieces uh, and steps for us to uh, make our decisions on. And the last thing are just, hey, you know, what are what are some of the business goals they're trying to achieve and what are some of the HR goals? It's really important to blend these two together so you can show both sides of the story. This is not only what we're doing for us, it's what we're doing for you. Uh, the second piece of that is starting to get into some of defining some of the actions. So one of the things I like to do is called innovation and ideas, which is a blue sky approach. It's like regardless of where you are as an organization, what would you like to accomplish? And then the action items are what could you actually accomplish, right? So it really kind of brings things to reality. And again, then we mesh these two together. So how do we how do we create this innovation with some of these act within some of these actions? And then we can look at prioritizing those, you know, based on either budget, maturity, resources, capabilities, et cetera. Uh, next slide is really around change management. So it's defining some of the impacts. A lot of strategies don't do this. It's actually really important from our opinion because this is the this is really the, 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 the first step in understanding who's gonna be impacted, the breadth of the impact, and some of the things associated, you can see here around mindset, expectations, behaviors, and values, right? What, what's, what's in it for everybody? Um, and it's really important to put this in the strategy because very often we can't articulate it. And so it's a great way to put this in up front. And I know if you, I, I'll send all of these to you, as I mentioned. Um, again, a prioritization model. I'm sure you've seen some of these, but again, this is where we're looking at, hey, what do we need to do now, do next, do later, don't do. I kind of like to look at it as my now, my midterm and my long-term and my don't do, uh, because I can put timing against it. Uh, I guess you can with this one as well, but it just helps me gauge. Plus again, it shows me some, a path to what my progress in innovation is. Um, yeah, this is just kind of taking that to that short, mid, and long term, so just an example of that. Um, again, lastly, any challenges, opportunities, competing priorities, it's great to understand what's happening in the organization that you need to be aware of um, so that you're not planning things on top of other things or, frankly, you're not doing things that are counterintuitive to what the business is doing. As an example, I've been in many organizations where we've been helping deploy systems and we found out they're laying off a big part of their staff, uh, not necessarily in HR, and then the question is, well, how can you spend the money on technology, but we don't have the money to pay these people, right? So it's really important as we think about coordination of efforts um, that we're bringing these to life. So we don't have to get, uh, we don't have to get those types of questions. Uh, lastly is the roadmap. So just a quick illustration of what something would look like, very detailed line item, what do we need to do? And this can get a lot de more detailed as well, right? So this is just a summary version that would go into the strategy. And then from there, we'd actually build some of that detailed planning, which again here is taking each of those actions, um, creating the initiative, uh, defining what the actually what those things are that we need to do to achieve that initiative, uh, put the timing, the owner, um, you know, the required resources, and then some success measures, right? Because we want to make sure that what we're doing is actually achievable, or, or being achieving what we want. Uh, just another example. Actually, this is not a detailed plan. This is actually the summary of the. Uh, value realization model, where I know it's hard to see, again, I'll send it, but basically it's talking about what are some of the e key HR priorities, what are the measures for HR, and then really looking at setting certain um, milestones and metrics to show that you're achieving those things, and then 
what are the outcomes and, and in some cases solutions or processes that are actually helping you solve those specific problems. So a lot of work. I mean, I, I'm, you know, this is a lot of time and effort to go into some of these things. But again, the effort that you put in above is gonna pay off a thousand fold as you start rolling this out. So last pulse, and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, and, and I do apologize for going through the template so quickly. Uh, where will you start in building your next gen HR strategy? A, I don't know where to start. B, understanding our current state. C, developing the strategy. D, prioritizing your actions and building a roadmap, or E, developing your strategic plan, and I can't read the rest, oh, that's it. Uh, strategic plan, create a business case, and visualization model, or I'm not going to do anything. And remember, the do nothing approach is not a bad approach. If you're not ready to do it, I'd rather you wait. So we'll give you a few seconds here. Probably a little more than a few. All right, we'll give everyone about 15 more seconds to answer the last polling question. Okay. All right, Brett, we're gonna move it on to the results here. Awesome. Uh, seven percent. I don't know where to start. That's fine. Um, hopefully today's session helped you understanding your current state. I love that answer. Right. If we don't know where we are today, we don't know what we want to become. Um, we're developing a strategy, which is fantastic. Again, I hope this session helped you out. You can use some of these templates. Uh, prioritize our actions, which is also uh, great to hear because uh, a lot of people try to bite off way more than they can chew, which I will tell you, high risk. Focus on what you can do now. There's always time to evolve, especially within cloud solutions. If you're looking at a cloud solution from a digitization perspective, much easier to change and morph, uh, developing the strategic plan, creating a business case, and okay, I'm not going to do anything, which again is no is just as good as the answer is yes. So if you're not ready, then you're not ready. Um, awesome, well, great, great polling uh, responses. So let's jump into the last, slide okay so i'm going to wrap this up i told you i was going to come back to these and i did so your call to action out of all of this especially for those who are kind of questioning where to start you're in the midst of your strategic plan and i would also say based on some of you who have already implemented or are implementing and looking to understand what's next these three questions are extremely um, not only valuable but highly influential and impactful. And so again, one question just ask yourself is, are you adding value? Is the exercise that you went through adding more value than what you were doing previously? The next, also the other question you could ask to this is, what can I do to add more value than what I'm doing today if you've already gone through that transformation exercise? Again, this is all about thinking about continuous innovation. The second is, is your function or services a competitive differentiator? Are you doing performance management the same way you always have? Are you doing compensation? Are you doing your same employee engagement, same acquisition programs and processes? If so, what can you do different? How can we bring in some of the new leading practices that are very effective in, in mitigating a lot of the risks that we're hearing in the industry? Uh, and this is your opportunity, again, whether you're baking this into a new strategy, when you're looking to evolve your strategy, to start bringing some of those in. This gets back to that experimental concept of digital transformation. Don't be afraid to try and fail. You're just learning from your failure to do better next time. And the last thing, are you meeting the demand of your customers? And your customers could be your leaders, your customers could be your business units, your customers could be partners, your partner, you know, whoever, right? Um, are you able to meet their demand? Is there growth coming? Is there is there shrinkage coming? Is there acquisitions coming? You know, what is the business scenario and are you set up for success to meet those needs? 
So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I know I did a lot of talking. Um, we don't have much time for questions. I will be sending an email out after this just so you can, um, just with, with this information. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to send them my way. You have my contact information um, and just respond to my email and, and I'll definitely address them as quickly as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brett, for a great presentation today. If we didn't have time to answer your questions, we'll do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certification is available for download now in the CPE window progress, the progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback to today's for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining. We hope you all join us again next time.